All right, guys, welcome back to Crazy Ball TV. Thank you so much for joining us again. Guess what? I got the crew with me. We're going to discuss the upcoming season. You know, tomorrow it starts. And as you can see, the Gunan out there, he plays New uh, was the Crystal Palace tomorrow. Yep. Before we start, please share, subscribe, like, support the channel. Please keep those likes up. Keep those subs up. Anyway, what's good, guys? Yeah, everything is good. Excited about new season. It feels yeah, like can't wait. This happens every year, right? <laughs> um, but still you can't match the excitement of the first day so i'm really excited I don't know, this year looks like there were just what six weeks this is when the season just ended now we're up in the new one right again right yeah, right what? again i have no and then plus with the world cup the world year, cup yeah it's gonna be non-stop football which i love but you know hopefully players can actually maintain and then at the end of uh next year this summer there's also is the euro Af african cup is coming up yeah afcon and then uh, there's, uh, I think, the Women's World Cup is also in the summer. And Olympics is next. So there's going to be sports still. That's right, yeah. For for, for, for foreseeable future. But guys, uh, how do you guys... I mean, we got a Basel fan. We got a, a Guna fan. The Basel fan, we know, guys, it'll take us like a whole year to dissect what kind of strange things they're doing over there. These guys have bullied Chelsea so many times that I don't even know if we should send Chelsea to La Liga, you know, and then we would take Celta Vigo or something because Chelsea right now has also tried to move Matt in the uh, transfer market. So we will talk about what's coming up tomorrow, specific, specifically Arsenal versus uh, Crystal Palace, which we'll discuss about the uh, the upcoming season. Who do you see as the, the winner plus the top four? And then, of course, we also got to talk about Barcelona and how mad they're moving in the transfer market. Uh, and then we'll see what we're what, going what for next, right? So, Gunafan, what are you guys' expectation for this coming season? Are you Ateta in, Ateta out? We shall see Ateta. What is it, man? So, um, I, I'm a believer of the process. Um, and I think this season is where you're going to start to see the process coming in. Um, I don't know if anyone got to check out the, I think it was the Athletic to, uh, interview with our technical director, Edu. Mm -hmm. And just the way he broke down the methods from when they took over to mm -hmm. right now. And he made a prediction that the 22-23 season was going to be the season that you saw the real Arsenal. Mm -hmm. So both I'm excited. Preseason was extremely good. Probably the best preseason I've ever seen us play. Right. I mean, we beat Sevilla. They were unfit, but we beat them 6-0 at home. Mm -hmm. Just romp Chelsea 4-0. Yeah, so man. those are the type of results and the performances mm -hmm. that I'm just really excited to see. And also, Gabriel Jesus, you know. This man, he he gives me shades of Alexis Sanchez when he first joined, a player yeah. that I know is talented, mm -hmm. but now gets to step into the spotlight. Mm. And also the attitude, um, he's just such a humble player, such yeah. hardworking. He leads from the front by his pressing, and I think right. he'll give us an all-new dynamic. So mm. I'm really excited. No. I mean, Basso, what do you think, man? I mean, the goodness, goodness things that they're going to win the league this year. I mean, I'm just going by what I see. I'm going to see on the Twitter, you know. <laughs> In those places, they think they're going to win this. So what, what do you think? So I think that this upcoming season, you it's if there's one time for a team like Arsenal, perhaps Tottenham, um, although they're allergic to trophies, so they can't vouch for that. Um, but this is the type of opportunity that those types of teams have been waiting for all these yeah. seasons. So Manchester City lost some of its biggest talent. And they have over the past uh, 12 months. So they right. lost Ferran Torres. They lost Eric Garcia to us. Mm -hmm. Now Jesus is gone. And you see there's a transition period where they're trying to reinvigorate the club. Right. And of course, as we see with Erling Holland, even though he's sort of unfairly getting criticized for missing an open goal, it's the Premier League is ruthless like that. So yeah. if there isn't an adjustment period, mm -hmm. City can be the team that's going to fall behind. And the other normal askers like Chelsea mm -hmm. uh, with the invasion, of course, and the scrutiny that's on the club itself. There's a whole bunch right. of institutional instability. I think Liverpool is the only club that would still pose the traditional threat. And I think they should be seen as title mm -hmm. favorites. But if there's any year that a team like Arsenal, like Tottenham potentially, um, is going to like step up and actually deliver performances against the top traditional top five mm -hmm. um, it's going to be this year. And notice I left out Man U because I don't think they deserve to be in this discussion. Now, Man U, Man U, they, 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 they trash right now. Um, they know it, but they think that the Man U uh, aura is going to pull them through this one. No. They won't. We'll talk about Man U, but um, I agree with you guys. I think, you know, Arsenal this year has a potential of doing something 
good this year. Honestly, my top four, they are in there. And it's funny how you brought Spurs in there because them two have made it. Uh, the thing that I'm concerned with Arsenal is this time you got more games. You guys are Europa. That Thursday, Sunday games are not easy at all. So if you're yeah. going to falter, it's going to be because of that. But what I could help you guys is the World Cup. So you guys could take a break. And I don't think you have that many players from your squad going to the World Cup besides Jesus and uh, that's it. I think it probably just Jesus and William Saliba. Saliba, yeah. Ago, yeah. And I don't think Martinelli is going and... Oh, Saka. Saka was also Yeah, Bukayo, yeah. And yeah. the British lads. Yeah. yeah, so unless... I mean, that's three. That's not bad. Because even Liverpool, we... Salah is not going. You know, uh, Diaz is not going. So I'll, we know Jota is going. We know... Or Allison is going, Trent. There's a, I, I think Henderson will go, but we got like three or four players that are going. So it doesn't affect us as much compared to City, who half of their team will be in the World Cup. Yeah, uh, exactly. Chelsea yeah. also has a lot of players going to be in the World Cup. For Liverpool, that would be the chance where they could have a sprint towards the end of the season. You start with a sprint, take a break, and then sprint out again. But um, in terms of Arsenal, Sometimes I always follow, like, I'm supporting Arsenal or I don't want them to fail because when you give Arsenal fans just that hint of, I feel sorry for you, and they will say something that I'll be like, why did I even, even think about trying to support these guys, right? I know what the, pro like you said, process, because that's what Liverpool did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then you have a lot of people out there who don't understand the process. They think Arteta needs to get out and blah, blah, blah. He spent all this money. And we should bring a better coach and bring Simone. If you bring, I'm like, you guys are living so much in the past. You think spending money or bringing a world class coach works? It doesn't work like that anymore. These days, if you are a coach, you have to coach. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's why I think that maybe even Manchester United, if uh, they give Ten Hag that time, he can build something. But the way things are going, they're still they stuck are. in the past. Where why do you have Ronaldo doing all these Ronaldos? How are you gonna bring a coach like Ten Hag and expect him to coach? When you don't even want to kick out Ronaldo and then they bring in Alex Ferguson back again to be in the uh, council role. Yeah, he's the yeah. reason why they are in the place in the first place. <laughs> so to me, Manchester United are not going to get out anytime soon. You know, I understand that he's trying to do it because they've been following uh, Barcelona, Frankie de Jong. The whole summer, the guys I don't want to come in there, Chelsea that's trying to scoop it in and they're still thinking that, oh, the coach is doing the right thing because he wants to get the right players, which is something that Liverpool started doing and everybody made fun of us. So what do you guys think about, I know uh, you were saying about City will struggle and that is a good start because nobody's been saying that. Everybody, who's going to win? Oh, City, which is so easy to say because they got money and pep. But it's not as they're struggling right now. There's a chance that they're going to lose uh, Bernardo Silva to Barcelona. If that guy go, I'm pushing my 60% of Liverpool winning the league to 75 <laughs> 75 interesting you know I mean, it's it's something could happen anything can happen right <laughs> we already started with a few injuries so that's why i was gonna say 85 but because of the injuries now if liverpool buys a, a midfielder oh that is 95 95 percent oh yeah that was 95 you saw the uh, the community shield that, that is fair the community shield showed i, I would say at very least Liverpool is more prepared at this point sure. for, for the yeah. season. Um, I think City, to Michael's point, to your point as well, oh. um, City is through a weird period where they're trying to solidify what their squad looks like. So right. they have some new players. Um, Alvarez looks amazing, frankly. Mm -hmm. And and Erling Holland's going to score goals. Like I think I that's one player you're, especially in City system, you do not have to worry about. But look at it this way though: Alvarez is gonna embed in that team quicker than Holland because they were struggling. The thing is, they couldn't figure out how to use Holland in the game, it's and true, that's yeah. and that's the part where Klopp outcoach Pep in that game because he waited. He didn't start new name. You know, he went back to the old Bobby false nine. And Pep was like, no, nah, I'm going straight to my new stuff. And you could see KDB was getting frustrated because, you know, Haaland was making runs that he's like, no. And the thing is also is Liverpool played a high line. And the high line was messing him up because he's like, if I run, I'm going to be upside. If I cut in, I'm running into VVD or I'm running to Matic. So KDB was a little bit off with trying to give him the pass, you know. So with Haaland, I think, yeah, he's going to score goals, but he's not going to score all that crazy goals people think he's going to score. But I believe that Alvarez is going to be more of a game changer for them than Haaland. Haaland is going to take him a little bit. You know, remember Pep had Ibra. It didn't work. <laughs> this is true, though. Saying claiming to coach Ibrahimovic is a different beast in itself, right? Yeah. Um, I, I do think that you, 
I slightly disagree with that in that I think that maybe with enough time to integrate into the squad, I think Erling Holland was such a kind of, it was inevitable that the transfer would happen, that mm -hmm. people miss what happens in most transfers, especially forwards, because confidence is key. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes you're playing in different systems, particularly mm -hmm. compared Dortmund versus City, right? Completely different systems. Um, so I think whenever a player of his caliber begins to learn the systems, when you're going to see, I think that people have kind of like assumed there'd be no grace period because of the quality of player he is. But even the best players, um, well, you know, maybe not Jesus, you know, but even the best players need that bit of period to, um, to acclimate to the new squad and particularly yeah. in a team that uses the ball as efficiently as uh, Pep City does. Uh -huh. What do you think? Especially the, the, the statement that I said, Pep tried Ibra. And I know it has to do with personalities too, but still he could not make Ibra how he wanted to play. Yeah, so I think that, I think it's true that Ibra, not every great striker will come into the team and be able to play. Like, mm -hmm. so we've seen it so many times. Uh, of course, the biggest example being Torres mm -hmm. um, in the oh, Premier League. Lukaku recently. Oh, Lukaku as well. Oh my goodness. So, million. <laughs> like, it's never a case just because someone scores goals, they can score goals everywhere, mm -hmm. even the world-class players. Right. Um, you have to take time to learn a system. Mm -hmm. Now, I think with Ibrahimovic and Barcelona, uh, at Barcelona, there was a particularly different pressure than there is in the Premier League. Mm -hmm. I won't say it's more or less, but in the Premier League, you know, all the meme pages are going to be getting ready if you miss, right? There's mm -hmm. a lot of pressure on the player, especially. And we aren't really talking about what you were talking about tactically, whether Erling Haaland was ready to start. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not it would be better if he was um, trying to figure out how they're going to play without the players that they lost, like right. uh, Jesus and Sterling, rather than just throwing the players you get in. And maybe this is all part of that tinkering process. Whereas I think with Ibrahimovic, because Barcelona, a lot of the onus is on the manager mm -hmm. uh, in the way that we think about La Liga. Back then, it was a lot easier to blame Pep Guardiola for what happened with Ibrahimovic. Yeah. When, like, Zlatan Ibrahimovic doesn't really fit our play style. Mm -hmm. He's, I, I personally don't think that he's the best among the top strikers we've signed. Mm -hmm. uh, like, ability wise, I think a lot of the things he had done before was inflated and it's easy. You take a great player and you take a great coach and so it should work and mm -hmm. it doesn't always work. So I think what Pep Guardiola perhaps is uh, one, he's done this before. So like in the back of his mind, he has to know, but uh, this could turn out. Mm -hmm. But I think like Mark pointed to um, like Zlatan, I mean, I'm sorry, Erling Holland started off like scoring what eight goals in a U20 or U19 match. Mm -hmm. Right. And then people were like, oh, but it's U19. Then he goes and he does it at Salzburg. And then he goes and does that at Dortmund. Mm -hmm. So when you have a player who, no matter what the challenge is, has the ability to sort of raise that level, to do what the coach is asking. Um, like Erling Holland has done this for both Jesse Marsh, then he went and Dortmund did it for like, what, three different coaches? That uh -huh. Dortmund went through and then uh -huh. he's now doing for Guardiola. Uh -huh. So there, all the indication is saying that he probably won't repeat the mistake that Zlatan did in the past. But, uh -huh. you know, the jury's still out. And I've, I'm a City fan. That's my worry. No, I mean, I think, see, that's why I say if they lose Bernardo, they're going to be in trouble. See, when Bernardo plays up top, he puts a lot of pressure on defenders. Yeah. You know, the boy can control. I hate that guy, but he can control the ball. You know, it's very hard to take the ball away from him. Right. So even against Liverpool, Pep had him in a six or eight role, a six and an eight, where KDB was the more advanced player. So KDB, when he gets the ball, the ball is going forward. He's coming straight to your throat. Bernardo, when he has the ball, he holds it and moves the ball around to make sure the runs are made. So him, Bernardo, and um, what's that guy? Folding works very well together because they could intricate passes, right? But that's right. where they lost Sterling, where he was able to run be to run behind defenders. Now you don't have that anymore. Greenlish, this thing is not working. You see what I mean? If 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 Holland is going to score a lot of goals, Greenlish has to step up big time because what Greenlish can do will open up chances for Holland. Holland just needs a chance. I mean, even with Liverpool, he had what two shots on goal. That one that he killed those birds. Liverpool make fun of them because they were making fun of us when Nunes at the beginning of the preseason against Manchester United, he did the same thing. Right. So that's where the banter is coming from. But if you know Haaland, he, he he misses like that all the time, you know? That's so, true, yeah. but uh, moving forward, what do you guys think about Chelsea? Chelsea is, to me, is making a whole bunch of purchases, right? But it doesn't make sense. The one that makes sense is just replacement, i.e. Kulibali for Rudiger. 
That's a replacement. You can choose who's better, right? Uh, who else? Sterling for Lukaku, it doesn't make, it, it, it does makes sense. Make sense. It, it doesn't make it doesn't. sense at the same time because yeah. it's not like for like. All you're doing is you're replacing uh, who was on their left side? Wenger. Uh, when, I said Wenger. When, right? Timo, who can mm -hmm. score, right? Uh, now you want to bring in, who Who are the person they're trying to bring in now? Uh, Mark Kukurela. Kukurela, Kukurela you have uh, Chilwell. So that means now 50 million is going out the window. Yes, he got injured. So I need somebody to explain to me what Chelsea is doing because a lot of people are like, oh, Chelsea buys all these players. Now, the players that they wanted a Basta sold from them, that would have made hella sense. Raf Rafinha, you know, Kunde, eh, I'm not too, too sold on him. Uh, he did want a Lewandowski, but he went over there, right? That makes sense because he's going to pump goals in. Now they want Obama. That makes a little more sense. But a lot of these players that they buy, it's just, they just spending to get people excited like when uh, Uncle Abram used to be there. You know, the American owner, you know, he's a winner, but he also doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah, you know I mean, so somebody explain it to me. What do you think about Chelsea with all these purchases that they're making? It looks fun, but this league, you know, the coach also is not impressive right now. Yeah, he do well in the Cups, but in the league. Yeah, so I think that, huh. If I were to give them a grade, it'd have to be like a D minus or something. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. Chelsea as a club mm -hmm. has always, I don't think their transfer business has ever made sense. Yeah. I mean, the Chelsea loan army is a thing. And like, I personally know this is both uh, like in a football sense and as a, like a moral sense. Mm -hmm. I think you can't talk about Chelsea in the way that Ch Chelsea as a modern club operates without talking about Roman Abramovich. Mm -hmm. The fact that he was using Chelsea for a shell company, right? Okay. And what happens when you're a shell company, money gets passed through you. That's why Chelsea was able to buy Timo Werner, Christian mm -hmm. Pulisic, Hakeem Ziyech, uh, three players who basically can play the same position. Same position. And then complain that, oh, we don't have attackers. You just bought six attackers. <laughs> so when Abramovich gets stripped of the club, I think, first of all, if you're a Chelsea fan and you're mm -hmm. angry about the transfer window, you can't be because, it, like, if all things are fair in the world, Chelsea Football Club shouldn't exist anymore. True. The, the way that Russian oligarchs are getting sanctioned, mm -hmm. like, Chelsea is very lucky it still exists as mm -hmm. an organization. It's, it was a personally held company, yeah. which means the British government had every right to go and strip it. So that's A. So coming off of that framework, I think a lot of fans were like, oh, you know, are we going to get uh, a transfer ban? Are we going to be able to play in the Champions League? Mm -hmm. And when the UK government gave the all clear, mm -hmm. you know, they get excited because they're like, oh, well, we do have money you can spend. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is you need to have a plan. Right. Now, for instance, the Jules Koundé uh, transfer is a perfect example of the dysfunction in Chelsea right now. Barcelona had been scouting Koundé for... Uh, the past year and a half, and it makes mm -hmm. sense because he's a La Liga player. Right. Ever since um, Xavi got to Barcelona, apparently mm -hmm. he was really intrigued about bringing him in. Chelsea was also interested, mm -hmm. and the story goes that Chelsea and Kunde meet quite a bit. But what does Chelsea do? They turn to Nathan Ake. They turn to Koulibaly. Mm -hmm. And as a player, if you're supposedly a top transfer um, target, and the club that you're the top transfer target is going and filling the market for all these other yeah. alternates to you, like you're going to take that some type of way. Right. Um, and if they're doing that with Kunde, they probably did that with Rafinha. They probably mm -hmm. did that with Dembele. I don't think they ever had a chance with Lewandowski. Um, so in essence, they're having to resort to picking up uh, sort of the scraps of other. Um, so I think what Omari Hutchinson. Yeah. Um, uh, Chukwe, the guy from uh, Aston Villa, and Chukwe, great young yeah, talents. Chukwemeka, yeah. Chukwemeka, yeah. Yeah, those are great young talents. But mm -hmm. like, will they play them? They just got Galga Slonina, the Chicago Fire goalkeeper. Yeah, who's incredible, will be a star. But like, he's just going to get loaned straight back to Chicago Fire. So as far as the here and now, it doesn't seem like Chelsea has a plan. They're going after every big name that's available mm -hmm. without a specific way to bring them to the club, and that's why they're losing out on all their rivals. Not because Barcelona is going around and poaching the transfers. <laughs> but they're trying to get uh, Frankie De Jong. Well, on your side, well, what's the what's the four one one? I I hype so any De Jong rumors this summer I just didn't yeah. believe so there was a credible journalist who was it Romero early in the summer yeah. uh, I think it was around May there was actually leaks to some Catalan media that yeah. because of the sort of uh, 
we didn't know whether or not we would vote for our financial levers, right? right. And you've heard that term thrown around, but because yeah. Barcelona is a socio, or it's like member um, owned, yeah. everything has to be voted on. So before the vote, part of the plan allegedly from the board was to look to sell Frankie de Young to generate mm-hmm. all this transfer revenue. So uh, apparently what they did is they made him available to Manchester United with no intention of selling to Manchester United, mm-hmm. but hoping that all these other big clubs, when they see that a club they like Man U is in. involved, they're going to jump in. Now yeah. that didn't happen, and hence why Man U has been chasing him for three months. Mm-hmm. And Barcelona has said like five times where it can sell. Mm-hmm. Um, and those rumors still persist. Now, I'm sure Chelsea was the type of club that mm-hmm. uh, Laporta was hoping to sell De Young to, mm-hmm. but I'm sure that was Chelsea before all of the turmoil and Chelsea right. before they were became a transfer rival. Mm-hmm. So I don't really see this as necessarily uh, as credible of mm-hmm. a rumor, but more importantly, I don't think it makes sense on the pitch. There's nothing about the way that Chelsea play that suggests that they need the type of midfielder that Frankie De Young is. Mm-hmm. It, it just doesn't fit their play style. Um, their, Chelsea isn't really known for their controlling midfielders who are yeah. sort of transitioning from um, attack to defense. Certainly not the way they play now. So Mark, I'm going to have you uh, hate Manchester United. What oh, do you yes, think yes, with Manchester yeah. United? What's going on? Because Manchester United, mm-hmm. right at the up France, I want to say I feel sorry for this. So delusional, it does maybe make sense. I don't feel sorry for them. For I don't feel sorry for them at all. You Actually, it brings sad. a smile in my face when something happens during the season when Liverpool do something crazy and I'm going to get mad looking at Manchester United and put a smile in my face. Absolutely. It's, it's a good like um, palate cleanser, you know? Oh, yeah. It just yeah. cleans your palate, you know, open it up. <laughs> now, okay, this thing with Ronaldo, right? Personally, sell him. As well, if I cancel his contract, let him go. Because we know Ronaldo is about Ronaldo. He already told you guys, I want to play Champions League. He came in there to, um, I love the club, I'm back, you know, the whole BS. Manchester United said, oh yeah, we got, finally got Sancho, we got Champions League Veron, we got Ronaldo. We're going to, you know, we just, we made the second, we're going to challenge this year. Then all of a sudden, everything went nose down. They got bamboozled by City to go by Ronaldo because somebody threw a rumor that Ronaldo's going to City and Ferguson and Rio Ferdinand and Gary Neville, all of them called the owners and were like, you can't let this happen. You need to bring Ronaldo home. To me, it's like Steven Gerrard and um, Jamie Carragher calling John Henry and say, you can't let Puccino go to Everton. Yeah. Even the king himself doesn't have a, a, a direct lie to John Henry to tell him who he should buy or who cannot buy. Right, Doug Leach, even at his state, who everybody knows he's the greatest Liverpool player ever, can't even call John Henry and say, you can't let Cuccino go to Everton. But team like Manchester United, that happens, which tells you like they have no structure. Absolutely. So I, I, what do you think is happening with uh, the, the Manchester United right now? So and how I are they going to do in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the league? Moving yeah. forward, yeah. So I, I agree with you. The lack of structure has been so apparent, even before Ronaldo. Mm-hmm. So if you look at the recruitment, um, purchasing Rafa Veron when Rafa Veron arguably has not been a world-class midfield, I mean, defender for a while, if you yeah. actually watch Madrid games previously, um, buying Jin Sancho when there's possible question marks over his fit, mm-hmm. over whether or not he's going to be an impact player. And it seemed like there, there just is something else driving the transfer strategy. I don't know if it's um, appeasing club legends. I don't know if it's appeasing the fans. Uh-huh. Um, but the Ronaldo situation, it's an interesting one because Ronaldo, is, this is the perfect Cristiano Ronaldo story in uh-huh. my mind because it's both very romantic. You know, he gets back to his boyhood club, etc. Yeah. Um, but then also it's very emblematic of the type of player Ronaldo has become in which unfortunately, and you know, United fans may be upset at me for saying this, but for Ronaldo, it's not about Man United. Uh-huh. Um, the move from um, Juve to United may have been, you know, financial, maybe even been aspirations of coming back as a conquering king of the Premier League. The fact of the matter is that Man United are just as dysfunctional as um, they are bad on the pitch. Mm-hmm. And that mixture with a strong personality like Ronaldo always was recipe for disaster. Mm-hmm. And particularly when you have a weak club captain in Maguire, a uh, captain who both can't defend or lead from the back, mm-hmm. as well as um, having a forward who can score many goals but does not inspire the same in a mm-hmm. lot of his players. And um, 
I remember right after, you know, the situation in the preseason match, you know, all this big news about, you know, the king. I mean, Ronaldo said it himself, right? Yeah, the king is Sunday, back. The king plays. And I'm like, okay, okay, dude. Um, but to leave early after making that Oh, statement, man, that one. That comes down to... Uh, there's something that's not quite and and, and that's what between. and that's why I'm saying bringing Ferguson in does not help. See, right now they're looking at it in the financial sense. First of all, you guys went to Asia, where that's Man- Manchester United territory, and yeah. he didn't go. That's why you guys are supposed to make more money. Yep, yep. And he didn't go. He showed up just to show up to you know because right now nobody wants Ronaldo. Mm-hmm. There's no top six team in the world that wants Ronaldo. Bayern came up and said, uh, great player, but not for us. Yeah. Massive contract to yeah. old, um, possibly, a, you know, manipulative agents as far as the, the clubs are involved. The fact that, again, with the city situation, who yeah. knows who leaked the fact that he was going to city? My he wasn't going to city. It was a trick. Mendes. It I was, guess it was. Yeah, it was Mendes who did it. Yep, exactly. And that's why he's very good at that. You know, he's not as brash as the late, uh, uh, what's the one who died? Um, Arayola. Arayola, right? Mendes is a he's a conniving guy who sits in the back and manipulates every every little thing. He's the one exactly. who did it. Manchester United fell for it, and you know it was a, yeah, it's a nice story. But dude, you didn't make it to the Champions League. Bring them back. The only reason why he wants to play Champions League because he's scared that Messi is gonna beat his record in the Champions yep. League goal. You Absolutely. Know? And you can't go to PSG because right now, hey, there's a new owner, but his name is called Kylian Mbappe. He wants to win, so he's controlling everything. Right, he's trying to say that they're changing culture and they're doing that at PSG, but that's my chance tonight. That I don't think they're going to do any well. But guys, now who do you think is going to be the top six team in order? Oh, in order. Oh, this is difficult. Come on, it's to be easy, easy. So one, I'm gonna to have to go with City uh, mm-hmm. at one. So while I do agree with your take on Liverpool having the advantage, um, I I do think that the potential of having uh, inform Erling Holland in the Premier League, as well as some of their other additions. And if they have some of their young players, if Phil Foden yeah. ends up becoming a full threat, I can really see them um, just becoming very, very hard to beat. Mm-hmm. Um, two, Liverpool. I think one and two is pretty much 50 50 for me. Every I year. One or two. Um, and at third, this is difficult because I want to put us at third. Um, hey, it's your world, man. It's your world. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I think th- third and fourth is going to be between Spurs and us. Mm-hmm. I think we're at a time in both of our issues where, you know, credit has to go where credit's due. Spurs mm-hmm. have done a really good job of squad building. Mm-hmm. Uh, so whether or not they have any type of culture that can develop winning, whether or not they can stop from choking against um, bottom six clubs, whether or not they can play in, a, you know, with that type of club environment, right. make their home field a fortress. Um, you know, who knows? That's up to Spurs fans. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that both Arsenal and Spurs, though probably on different paths, are at places where I think right now they can put the imprint in the Premier League. Um, I don't see United making top six, mm-hmm. to be completely honest. Um, so I'd say um, Chelsea at five and another club at six. Who knows who it could be? I have suspicions about... Um, Newcastle having a very surprisingly good year. I mm-hmm. think there's some very good players there, um, as well as too much money. Um, Aston Villa, though they took several steps back, um, I do think that they could be around the top eight area. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a few other clubs that I think could probably spring some surprises. Okay. Uh, just not United. Mm-hmm. Oh, if anything, if it cuts off, I'll call you guys again. All right. Yeah, what's, what's, what's yours? So I, I think that generally I agree. So I may go with a more controversial take. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and of course, La Liga fan. Um, yeah, no bias. Can't really speak for the, <laughs> so no bias. Um, so I think number one, I'll have Liverpool. I think Liverpool will, will win the title this year only because I think if you look at their squad, Liverpool has done a better job keeping their squad intact and mm-hmm. replacing than City has. And I think City's role players, perhaps, uh, like I said, losing Garcia, losing Torres, uh, losing Sterling, mm-hmm. Jesus, that's going to all affect them in those matches, like you're saying, you know, when you're coming back from the Champions League games and uh, City has always been prone to have random like lapses against bottom six. Clubs. Right. So I'm going to have Liverpool at one, um, but I'm going to actually have Arsenal at second. And this is my what? controversial pick. So what? I think this guy turned made as viral. <laughs> I think that Manche- while Manchester City on paper is the better club, mm-hmm. make no mistake. I think 
that because of a lot of the turnover, that perhaps there will be more stress points in there. And I think it's Jack Grealish personally, uh, but there's going to be definitely places where it can be exploited. And I think if they have a massive collapse in Europe or something, then they really risk falling back in, in the Prem. And, you know, it's harder to be consistent in the Prem than it, it used to be when City was, you know, running away with the league with so many points. Uh, and the reason why I have Arsenal at second is because I think Arsenal will do this year what they didn't do last year, which is pick up the easy points. Um, I think mathematically, even if Arsenal had picked up all of those points that they should have last season, you're talking about a top three club. So have to go my top three. And I think with momentum, they could be second. Um, so that leaves four. This is where it gets tough because I think Chelsea will be in and around there. Um, but again, the way that Chelsea is operating this transfer window is not a good sign. Thomas Tuchel won't make the end of the season, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I have to put them at six and I'm putting a surprise club. Uh, no, I'm going to have Tottenham at four and a surprise club at five with Chelsea at six. I think that surprise club could be Aston Villa. I think it could be Crystal Palace. Uh, but I'm thinking a team that isn't um, going to be doing traditionally well. Mm. Um, maybe even a team like Leeds, uh, Bournemouth, <laughs> Southampton. All of these teams, I think it'll just take one of them to have like a really good season. Yeah. And you could see them in, the, in a top six situation. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, that's the controversial version of my take. So <laughs> I'm shocked. I mean, usually I thought I'm the one. I went to <laughs> one of my uh, guys from the other side of the pond, uh, Grace Cat, and I started a whole beef between me and Manchester City fan. But this one is like this one is taking the whole cake. Oh well, if City thought they're going to. I mean, if um, United particularly thought they're going to be in the top six, no way. Uh, but City, I, I just don't see them winning a, a title this year. You know what the fun thing is. We all have the same top four. I haven't said mine yet, but we all have the same top four. And with mine, I have, uh, of course, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be biased at all. I'm never biased. As you do, right? You know, I mean, I have to pick the right, the right champion. You can't just pick anybody to just be champion, right? It, it, it's okay. So, you, can choose, you can choose City. It's all right. What's up? You no, the city. reason why I can't choose City this year, I'm not going to be as controversial as our astute Barcelona fan. So like I was saying, uh, we can't be biased. Like I'm never biased. So number one, of course, is Liverpool. I mean, the, the, choosing Liverpool and City, it's, it, it's no shame because of last year. We were 50 minutes away of winning this thing. Uh, Boston Villa played us. And this year, I feel like City has gotten weaker, which people are not looking at. The players that Pep needs, they are not just any type of players. He has to get specific players. And right now, when you look into the market, he doesn't have to. Where is the Sterling? Alvarez, okay, maybe. But Alvarez almost plays just like Grealish. He's quick, and he controls the better, better than uh, Sterling. So in, in, in Alvarez, I can see there's some you know, good whether he's better than Sterling, we will see. Sterling scored a lot of goals for them. Jesus wasn't a guy who was always in there, but when he comes in, he could contribute. And he changes the pace. You know, that was the difference between Jesus and uh, uh, Aguero. Because Jesus yeah. press, he presses, he works his, you know, he works his socks off. Uh, Shechenko wise mm, you know, he was in and out of the team. But I see the person that people are forgetting is Fernandino. You see, when City lost uh, company, it affected them for a couple of years, you know? Mm -hmm. And then now you lost another rock like Fernandino so I think that is going to be you know yeah they have Walker but Walker's getting really old and they haven't replaced that you know Kuku wasn't it Kuku Kukuyela was a great buy but they couldn't get him now Chelsea's you know stolen from it but I say one Liverpool two City three Arsenal no no sorry three first because people are sleeping on the content he's annoying his football style is boring but he ha he's buying the players that he needs to do exactly what he wants he's building a whole new i won't say new chelsea but he's building a whole new inter milan at spurs whether they're going to win a trophy that one is a miracle right but i think spurs will come in third and then fourth <laughs> arsenal fifth between third fourth and fifth it's not going to be that much of a difference but at the end of the day i think first and arsenal make it to the top four fifth is probably going to be chelsea six don't sleep on west ham people are sleeping on west ham have done very well in the market 
You know, they didn't lose anybody and they bring in more players in. So West Ham, watch out for West Ham. Uh, Bowen is staying, so that's a good player for them, you know. So I think West Ham six, seven Manchester United, eight probably Newcastle, you know, and then after that, everybody else. But the way things are going, it's not, it doesn't look good for uh, Chelsea in terms of scaling and staying in the top four because they will start well, and then during Christmas, they fall off. So, yeah, there's a break in Christmas, but guess what? All their players are going to World Cup. The so, World Cup. Yep. I, don't see, I don't see them be able And they haven't bought the right players. They just bought players just for the sake. It's going to be fun. It's going to be sexy. Oh, they got this. They got the you know, Just like you were saying earlier, it does not fit, you know? And the thing also we have to remember, Tuchel has never built a team before. Every team he has sure, ever yeah. gone to was already there. That Dortmund yep. team... That wasn't his. That was Klopp's. Obama here was there before. Obama here was there where Klopp, Klopp is the one who brought Obama here. Right. Marco Royce, that was Klopp. Now, 75% of that team was already Klopp. When he went to PSG, of course, we know what PSG is, <laughs> right? When he came to Chelsea, that's not his team. You know, he's a great, when it comes to cup competition, he does well. That's why they were able to sneak in into the Champions League and he had coached Pep in the final. Because the real reason why he won the Champions League because Pep, did the pep thing, overthinking, and then costing him a championship. So he has never built a team. So this team going on is his. He's not going to try to think that he can get away, you know, slide away from the Lukaku fiasco. He agreed on Lukaku. Yeah, that's right. personal responsibility. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? If you were going to spend $100 million, he could have gone to anyone, Dortmund, and get Haaland. Because mm -hmm. 100 million would have gotten Holland out of Dortmund. So he cannot get away with that. You know, Chelsea fans don't get it, but they, like, oh, no, 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 no. Tuchel's a good coach. He's a, but he is not that dude. You know, that Champions League trophy has saved him a lot. But anyway, we will get away from the EPL a little bit and give the, 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 the podium to the Barcelona. Catalan gentleman over there, and for him to give us at least how they're making this thing work. We were told this they file for chapter seven, chapter eleven, chapter twelve. <laughs> we we were told they don't have any money. They can't even register players. They owe Messi a hundred million. They owe PK eighty. They owe the young Frankie the young what seventeen. Talk to us. I mean, this thing is a miracle. A lot of teams are going to stay to you guys and do the same thing. Yeah. So I think that as a starting point, like Barcelona, and I mentioned it earlier, like Barcelona and I'd like some other clubs, but very few major clubs are this way, mm -hmm. are like an institutional disadvantage based on how they're set up. Mm -hmm. uh, and also because of the fact that we're in La Liga. So La Liga has a lot stricter of uh, salary uh, restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's aggressive. And as much as it, it's annoying, it's probably a very good thing because it keeps the league competitive, et cetera. Uh, so that always has to be kept in mind. But then also we don't have a Roman Abramovich that can just go and mm. dump a whole bunch of money when you know we need more money for our salary. Um, it just doesn't work like that. We have to generate money somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so because of the pandemic, uh, a whole bunch of football clubs got into debt. But per for like a club like Manchester City, for instance, uh, you could just inject that lost money to the club. Mm -hmm. um, you can't do that with Barcelona. Like it's particularly against the rules as far as what Barcelona is as a structure. Mm -hmm. So what that meant is clubs like us got hit a little bit harder with the pandemic. Now, of course, that's compounded by years and years and years and years of financial mismanagement mm -hmm. brought us into a crisis, uh, a debt crisis. I'm now, to be very that. clear, like Real Madrid, Tottenham have like sort of almost equivalent debt as we do. Mm -hmm. And football debt isn't something that's very odd for a club to work with. And in general, when you're talking about corporations, it's not like debt doesn't necessarily mean you're broke. Mm -hmm. um, so, but for us, we were broke, <laughs> to be very clear. So um, I'm glad you went that route because I was like, where is he going with this one? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's sort of the framing of our situation. Maybe it's a little bit of a misunderstanding from the media. It's not a case where we didn't have anything in our transfer budget. Um, it, we just didn't have as much because like, again, it's based on your revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also importantly, uh, sort of your spending money and your salary money are completely different. So a lot of people, I, I've heard the thing like, how can you sign Lewandowski um, and Rafinha when you haven't paid uh, 
uh, Frankie de Young is wages. Mm -hmm. So first, it's not a skippable wage, it's a deferment. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason why you can is because it's just completely different. That's a different budget. It, the two don't really have anything to do. So uh, in order to sort of raise the, generate the missing revenue that we need for both player registrations and transfers, uh, back in, I think it was May, uh, John Laporta has uh, begun discussing these so-called economic levers, and there's four of them. So the first one is Sangha minority, uh, I think a 25%, no, 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 it was up to 49.9. I think maybe 25 is what we agreed to, and I'm forgetting the vote now. But uh, uh, minority share of our BLM, which is Barca licensing and merchandising, merchandise. Mm -hmm. So selling it to a club, I mean, to an organization that's going to basically be selling our shirts for us, something before that we did ourselves, mm -hmm. and all of the merchandise. And then the other one is uh, La Liga TV deal. So 25% of that money, uh, there's supposedly going to be a lever that's going to be general economic sales. And we're in that process right now. Uh, Ricky Pooch just got sold to a galaxy, mm -hmm. uh, which is a whole other story. Um, mm -hmm. And then... <laughs> Uh, wage reductions. And of course, the wage reduction is important because, again, a lot of these lovers just wouldn't be affected by that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so far, you had Usman Dembele taking a significant wage reduction to resign. And mm -hmm. the whole goal is to sort of get the entire squad under, I think, what is it, 8 million? That's the figure that's been thrown around. Um, but basically, getting the entire squad to a wage that truly I don't think any other big club would have players on such little wage. Which that's where I wanted to know. That's why I don't really blame Barcelona with their business because they're just a, a shark. The players are the ones that are annoying the hell out of them. Rafinha, you were making 60 at Leeds, four old Leeds, who just came back from relegation. Now you're making 30 at Barcelona. That's the rumor we heard, right? You're never going to make any more money anywhere you go. It's over. You are basically cut your foot off. Somebody like Robert, we understand. He already won anything. He made all the money. He could come to Barca. So it's more of a try, you know. I've done everything. I want everything. Let me see how it goes. So him is why a year two hit that. Probably end up in MLS. But people like Rafinha, it makes no sense. Dembele, it makes sense. No, no, Dembele, yes, cutting his wages down and him staying makes sense, right? But people like Rafinha, uh, who else are they guy? Kunde, Barca needs defenders. But Rafinha doesn't make no sense. Cutting your wages down like that makes no sense. If Salah wanted to leave Liverpool because we were not going to pay him a matching wage with the big boys. And can you imagine he ends up in Barcelona getting a lesser salary than what Liverpool was giving to him already? That, that's what is going on with the whole players who are going there. Some players can't even get registered. Umtiti refused to leave. Yeah, and I think... <laughs> So because Barcelona is both historic, not saying Liverpool, I mean, Liverpool is also historic, mm -hmm. Barcelona is historic, but it's both historic and it has that sort of allure that no other club. So Real Madrid, mm -hmm. uh, Barcelona, arguably, maybe Manchester United, but I don't think because who wants to go and live in Manchester, right? Mm -hmm. um, like these are both destination cities, especially mm -hmm. Barcelona. So mm -hmm. The beach is right there, Ibiza is far, but it's also, you know, if you're Brazilian, for instance, you grew up watching Dino, um, so, mm -hmm. you know, like, imagine if I got the opportunity to play for Barcelona, I would take a wage cut. So um, there is a bit of that going on, but sort of the fear that I have. So Juan Laporta here is trying to sort of redefine the way that we do player wages, mm -hmm. which is fine. However, I just always, and you know, I, I be battling Barca fans too, um, mm -hmm. because a lot of us don't got no sense. But if we are supposedly the best club in the world, Mm -hmm. one of the historical clubs in the world um, with one of the best squads ever, right? I think it's fair that players who play should be getting the best wages. Like, yeah, I don't think... No, you're yeah, right. Eventually, it's going to get... It's like uh, Golden State. Eventually, people are going to be like, give me my money. See, right now, you have right, a lot but, of kids. You have a lot of kids and you have a lot of players who just want to go to basketball. So you could twist their arm. I imagine when Gavi... Uh, the Gavi, yeah, Gavi and Pedri get to that level where they be like, hey, dude, I'm 25 years old. You need to pay me. Right. You know? But I think what's going to happen is that now Laporta is going to attempt to do this. I personally don't think it will work. But what he's going to attempt to do is probably for the next five years, sort of just redefining our wage structure 
perhaps in hopes that other European clubs will follow. I can imagine there are other clubs who are hit hard by the pandemic will, like you said, study what we've done and say, okay, let's start asking players to take pay cut. Mm-hmm. But I just don't think that works long term. That's not long term. Uh, unless you would have to have the whole football world just agreeing to make a lot less money. And mm-hmm. even if footballers wanted to do that, they have agents that don't. Yeah. So I think as much as we are getting work done because a lot of players are making sacrifices. So Sergio Roberto, Jordi mm-hmm. Alba, uh, Sergio Pesquets, yeah. uh, Umtiti himself took a pay cut, Dembele, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, and all of these players are willing to put aside their interests for the better of the club. I just hope that whenever the end of that contract goes, you know, the club is willing to, you know, honor what they did for the club. Mm-hmm. Now, particularly with Laporta, my main criticism with him is his ruthlessness and his sort of penchant for authoritarianism at, at times. Mm-hmm. And I can see when a player like Dembele, two years goes from now, he's going to just like say, okay, bye. Yeah. When, a, like, to be very clear, Usman Dembele took a significant wage reduction to stay at Barcelona. And I just don't think it's ethical for a club to do that and well, not on this go one, in honor. On this one, I'll go with the club. Dembele hasn't played a game in about 10 years. And he's so, he's, he's in the 400,000 a week player. So, no, so I, while I do agree with that, so I think A, because he's also one of the top assisters in La Liga, had that been anyone else not named Usman Dembele, he'd be getting a pay raise. Like, in fact, some people have in their clauses, if you lead the assist charts mm-hmm. for the team or the league, you get paid more. So that's A. But then, like, I think it's not necessarily about the particular player itself. Like, I think if Dembele had played every single game and somewhat lived up to his price tag, he would still be asking to take a wage cut because of the way that his agent was pushing for uh, salary demands. Uh, the hardline stance back in January when mm-hmm. Laporta basically said he's not going to play another game in, um, for us. You, like, I just don't think that it's ethical to, to say that type of things to players mm-hmm. and to then expect players to take the sacrifice for the club and go back and say, you know, hey, we need to take another pay cut. Because when does it end? Um, so I'm excited about what we're doing. I'm excited that we're very likely going to register all our players because mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. some more economic shifting around. That's going to be... <laughs> but but the I thing just is, hope that we... Um, Liverpool, we did uh, incentives. Is it the same thing you guys are doing? So the thing with our contracts is per EU law, mm-hmm. no contracts are made, or the club cannot make... Uh, these types of things public. So mm-hmm. the best we have is media speculation. Okay. Um, so I wouldn't, I don't think there's been any reliable reports onto whether or not those things are structured mm-hmm. incentive wise. I think for a lot of the players who did take pay cuts, in true what it, truth what it was, they said, okay, I'm gonna defer this year's wages to two seasons on, then you're mm-hmm. gonna come and pay. And that's what you're seeing with De Jong right now. He deferred, I think it was a season ago, Mm-hmm. And or two seasons ago, I'm forgetting. And now Last, it's yeah, just that time. Was, uh, two when the pandemic hit. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, good enough. And we've been educated by the Barcelona on how they do business <laughs> over there. Half of it I don't understand do because I think they 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 steal the money somewhere. <laughs> now I'm just like eventually somebody's gonna come and be like, you need to explain to us what you guys are doing. Um, I mean, you have to give it up to Laporte because if he doesn't, you have to sell the club to. The one person, you know, like the rest of the world, most of the world is do it because Barcelona is all by the fans. So mm-hmm. it seems to me like one, either they know something a la Super League, or two, they be like, hey, this thing doesn't work. We just sell it to a rich oil person or some rich billionaire to come save us. So that's why I think they're going with this. But back to the Premier League tomorrow, what? Are you expecting, Guna? Okay, so I'm expecting one a tough game. Um, mm-hmm. Crystal Palace looks easy enough on paper, but this is in Selhurst Park. Mm-hmm. Crystal Palace arguably have some of the most intense um, fans, one of the mm-hmm. most intense home atmospheres. Um, but what I'm expecting above all is a very intense game from Arsenal. Mm-hmm. Um, so you'll probably see um, a lot of the new names start. So Zinchenko mm-hmm. probably will start left back. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll definitely see um, William Saliba partnering with Gabriel Magalesh in the back. Mm-hmm. Um, and importantly, at least to me, you're going to see Gabriel Jesus probably mm-hmm. leading the line with either Martinelli and Saka on either mm-hmm. side. Um, and I think what that brings is a lot of intensity. Um, the way you've seen Arsenal play in preseason really have not given teams a chance to 
get onto them to attack them. Um, in the Orlando game, there was a few moments where um, some of the backups were in and you could tell the difference in the levels because mm-hmm. when the starters came in, the game just completely closed up. They weren't able to pass out of the back. And um, hopefully that's the type of pressure we can exert on Crystal Palace, who mm-hmm. although they're a magnificently coached team, and I'm not just saying that because it's Patrick Vieira, um, they actually have taken steps forward as a team. Um, they have a few pretty good signings. They signed Chris Richards from Bayern Munich mm-hmm. in the back. Um, and then also, again, that home atmosphere is going to be very, very difficult to play. It's hard to play over there, man. So, But if I had to predict, I would not be surprised to see Arsenal run away with the game. Um, the level at which, particularly the f- front three are playing between, mm. or front four between Odegaard, Jesus, Martinelli, and Saka, um, these players just, it's almost like a different level of hunger, especially if you see them um, pressing high early on. Um, it's, we'll have to see if Crystal Palace can actually deal with that. Well, I have to tell you this. Crystal Palace have lost a big player, Gallagher, you know, going back to Chelsea. But if a, a team like Crystal Palace are very good at holding pressure, those people can take pressure. Remember, they almost beat City at Selhurst Park last season, right? And then when, um, what's his name? The guy who coached Manchester United, uh, a.k.a. Professor, the guy who oh, created... Oh, Ragnick. Ragnick, the guy who created a gang impression. Remember when... Uh, Crystal Palace went to Old Trafford. They pressed him for 20 minutes and they held that pressure. They lost that game off a fluke goal by Ronaldo, right? Yeah. That game, that's when even Ragnick was like, yeah, these guys can't press because Crystal Palace tore them apart just that they didn't finish. So I would say, yes, you do have the energy to press them and you have the players, you know, Odegaard and um, was the party and those guys to hold the ball. But you have to be careful with those guys because Serhus Park, it's an aggressive stadium. The fans are going to be up to it. It's the first game of the year, the first game of the season. You're going to bring the pressure. They're going to be able to take the pressure. They got players that can hold pressure. But now, how are you guys going to deal with uh, Zaha? How uh-huh. are you going to deal with uh, Eduardo? You know, Benteke, all these guys. So... To me, I'm excited. I'm just like, this is going to, either Arsenal season is over tomorrow, or they think they're going to win the league tomorrow. As our Barca fan said, they're going to come in second. So tomorrow will be what decide because it's not going to be one game and then your season is over. But knowing the Arsenal fans and the way they oh, oh, the way they react on every little thing, they're going to come by blaming the ref. That one I know for sure. There's going to be a blame to the ref. That's, why didn't you watch the FVAR? Why did you do this? So, you know, I'm not going to hold you guys. As we said, 30 minutes. Now we are almost on an hour. But I want to thank you guys for coming once again. And of course, you know, I will do my best to get you guys here after the uh, the window has closed. And then we could revisit our top four or top six again. But trust me, Chelsea is going to buy more players. They're going to do madness in the, se- in the, in the window. But oh, to absolutely. me, the players that they're buying is just they're buying a whole bunch of players. There's no plan into it. You know, yep. Arsenal buying Jesus, that was a replacement for Obama. That's why I'm very, very, I'm trying to tell Arsenal fans, calm down because Jesus scored goals. Obama has scored a boatload of goals. So you see what I'm saying? It's just a replacement. And then you're going to be playing more games. So you have to be sure. careful with that. You know what I mean? So, uh, and then we don't know anything about Vieira, even though that kid has skills. He's very techy. So that one we will see. But tomorrow is gonna it's gonna be a, it's gonna be exciting. I mean, you know, that was the perfect pick. You got the the former player Vieira going against his former team at a place where the noise is deafening. And Crystal Palace, I think they're gonna be in the top ten this year. I would not be surprised. Yeah, yeah. They're gonna be in the top ten. So. Guys, thank you so much. Please share, subscribe, like. As you can see, we put in our knowledge. We had a Barcelona financier come up here and educate us on what's going on. Uh, but before we go, any of you guys bringing any new players? Or you guys are done. I know Barca won't silver. Please take it. <laughs> Whatever I how you guys do business, please take the silver. Take it. I will pay for you guys to have them. I got a, some money, you know, some money stash somewhere. I, I will give you guys something. Hey, if that's the case, hey, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind. Would not mind at all. No, take silver. <laughs> he, he he wants to leave. He's been trying to leave for over a year. So, you know, take him. Yeah, for, for us, you know, still keep an eye out on um, Yuri Tielmans. It's a player mm-hmm. that we've been tracking for a long time. Yeah. Would not be surprised to see him and another wing player coming in. So, still exciting things. I think Edu's going to still have some 
few tricks up their sleeves. No, Edu has done well. Edu has done well. He has bought the right players. The only problem with Arsenal that I worry is you guys need somebody like a Jordan Henderson or a James Milner. That's uh, like why someone old over the hill. That's why you. That's why your project is taking so long because you don't have a true, true winner. James Milner coming to Liverpool will help us. Oh, this is true. We're getting two of City's players and No, they are not the same. They are not. They are not James they, Milner or Henderson. Or, but they have won and, titles. But they were they were followers. Followers. There's a difference. Even Sterling going to um, Chelsea is not a Fernandino. It's not a Milner. Mil Milner is a professional. This guy. Henderson is a professional. They won. This is true. Alexander Zinchenko has captained his national team side. That guy cries every at the day. Highest level. Has played at the highest level and brings a That man cries every day. Tomorrow, if you lose, he's going to be Tr crying. I guarantee trust me, you. Trust me, Zinchenko is going to do some things. Okay. I'm and that's what I'm, I'm saying. I'm telling you. Mark my word. That's why Chelsea keep making up to turn because they got Aspie, uh, Aspie in that team. You know, they got uh, Silva in that team. That thing helps, man. That's the thing that Arsenal fans never respected. That's why your development took so long. When you had Vieira, no nonsense. You don't have that right now. The coach is the person, but the coach doesn't cross the white line. And yeah, the fact that and the fact that he played, uh, you never walk alone at practice. That alone was comical because if you have a player like Milner, Milner would be like, coach, what are you doing? You know, those those vets, those players that if they are professional, they bring 110% every day. Those type of players would have pulled them aside and be like, hey, I know what you're trying to do, but we got cameras watching us. Why are you going to do this? Now you guys are becoming me. I understand this, the psychological part of it. Hey, all I'm saying is that all the memes... Almost got us for it. It wasn't for two games. Wow. So that that's that results. You can't cannot cannot argue with results. You have to understand, right? Liverpool, I can look back and say the game that we didn't win cost us the league. I can oh, pick three, I can pick two, three sure. games that I'd be like going up 2 0 against Brighton and throwing at the Anfield. That cost us the league. Brentford, we win in the game and then they caught up. That's how you you have this year, you have to win 10 games to 10 to 15 games in a row. To even make third place, is Arsenal ready to do that? I, I'm just saying, just just watch. That's what if I'm you saying. You don't believe it, just watch. No, 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 I'm gonna. I know Kateta has done well. He's a good, he's a good football brain. But the fans, Arsenal fans, just wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow, I just want you guys to lose just so that I could just laugh, bring you guys down to earth. But like I said, you guys are in my top four, so it, it's it's at the end of the day, you will make the Champions League. But remember, there was a guy named Brendan Rogers who was one Steven Gerrard slip away and win the league. And the following year, he was from second to seventh. It was also Brendan Rogers. So, he was yeah. also Brendan Rogers. So, yeah. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> so I just, just want to throw it out there. You know, a lot of times people are like, yeah, we, oh, we could win the league. I'm like, yeah, you could, you could win the league. Anybody one year can win the league. But you see, you have to be consistent. City has been up there for five, six years. You know, Liverpool, we're going to our fourth year being in that. 90s and we still get becoming side checks. We keep getting to 90s and CD picks up at one point. That is hurtful. Last year we were almost the quad. We were gonna be the we were gonna trash the invisibles, the Manchester, <laughs> and what they call no. it, Manchester Treble, all those things. If we had won, we were 15 minutes away, would not Aston have made Villa a put 10 people in the back, and then our defense and our midfielders fell asleep versus Madrid, and then they the best player. For Madrid was the goalie. How embarrassing. The whole Real Madrid, your best player was the goalie. It sounds like Real Madrid to me. So see. <laughs> but this year we're going for the quad. Watch Liverpool. Watch that space. Carlin oh, Cup. Okay. We're already winning the community shield. We're taking it. That doesn't count the quad. But... I don't care. We're taking every trophy. The same way Spurs takes the Audi Cup as a trophy. We're taking every trophy. <laughs> No, but no, you guys have enough trophies. You, you don't need to do that. Oh, we need more. We need more. <laughs> no, uh, definitely at least a double, I can say. We need a sure. double. We need, double. We need one of the big boys and something. We can't go with just two small ones. We need one big boy and one small. Even if we don't win one small one, the community shield will count. But we need one big one. One oh, big yeah. one has to be <laughs> the league or the Champions League. But anyway, guys, thank you so much. Please share, subscribe, like. This was supposed to be like two minutes and now it's... It's almost an hour. <laughs> you know how we do. <laughs> yeah, guys. So thank you so much for joining. I appreciate you guys. We we shall we shall revisit this conversation again. But Barcelona, um, that 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 business thing, and we need to find out what's going on. Get to the bottom of it, you know. <laughs>